Um, thank you, everybody. Um, thanks for joining this, uh, this session. Uh, as he said, there will be two, two sessions about Micronaut, so I hope you will uh, enjoy them. Um, let me introduce my, uh, myself first. Uh, my name is Alvaro Sanchez. Uh, I am working at Oracle Labs, uh, or Oracle, wherever you like it. Um, I'm well, coming from Madrid, as you can tell from my, from my British accent, it's like uh, perfect. Um, uh, I've been all, always working on the Java ecosystem, uh, and currently I'm working on, on Oracle Labs, on, on Micronaut, and GraalVM, uh, or part of, part of GraalVM. Uh, and um, uh, well, I've, I've put some, some of the things that I work on on the project, uh, but it's mainly build tools uh, and the, uh, um, Kubernetes integration, uh, uh, integration with other clouds, etc. Uh, I'm also um, I'm also want to to tell you something because. Um, as, as you can see on the slide, uh, I've been working on Micron since the beginning. So we started this project in 2017. Uh, the team cre uh, creating Micronaut is the team who was working on Grails. Uh, anyone knows Grails? Raise your hand if you know that. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah. So we started in 2017. Uh, originally, this wasn't called Micronaut. Uh, we had a code name which was uh, Particle. But Particle, um, we couldn't choose that name because uh, you know the domain name was, was chosen, so we had to to find so something else. Uh, so we ran a poll internally in the team to choose a new name for the framework, um, and I proposed an idea which wasn't selected. I still don't get why. Uh, I proposed the framework to be named Summer. And uh, you, will, you will guess why, and it's because uh, summer is better than spring. This is meant to be a joke. <laughs> um, winter is coming, winter is coming, winter is coming. That could be another option. All right. Um, okay, so now I would like to know about you. Uh, so how many people is using spring? Spring Boot. Yeah. Keep your hands raised. How many are using Quarkus? Okay, everybody can leave the room, please. <laughs> no, I'm joking, I'm joking. Uh, those are great frameworks, of course, but I'm presenting you something new. Uh, how many have ever heard or used, actually used Micronaut? Okay, very few. You're in the right place. Um, so yeah, um, we've heard before, uh, before we get further, uh, I have the slides on, on speaker deck, so you can take a picture if you want. Um, so let's talk about Micronaut. Um, there's three things, three ideas I would like you to get from this session. One is that Micronaut is a modern Java framework. Uh, as I said, we designed this from scratch in 2017, thinking on the type of applications um, that uh, were created or are created uh, nowadays. So that is microservices, serverless functions, uh, you know, message-driven applications like Kafka, consumers, reproducers, etc. If you think about it, none of that was or existed in year 2000 when your popular Java framework was created, right? Um, so, so we wanted to, 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 to take a step back and to create something new, thinking on the type of applications that uh, you could use uh, uh, now. The second idea is that you can use Magnet for any kind of application. Uh, people typically use it for creating like, um, you know, microservices, REST servers, APIs, etc. But you can create command line applications. You can create, uh, like I said, serverless function. You can create uh, a Kafka consumer or producer with no server whatsoever, um, whatever you name it. And the third idea, performance. Performance is really important for us. Uh, it is highly optimized in terms of memory consumption and in, in terms of startup time. 
Uh, and the way we do that is with the Java facility uh, that existed since a long uh, time called Annotation Processing uh, Tool, APT. So there is uh, a technique called AOT, ahead of time compilation. Uh, the idea is that the, all the things that the framework needs to do, if you think about, for example, when you, in Spring or Jakarta E or whatever, when you use a at auto wire or at inject uh, on a constructor or whatever, um, those frameworks, those traditional Java frameworks will typically at runtime uh, generate a proxy um, using a, like a, like a CGLib library or whatever will generate a proxy class that they will, you know, um, uh, uh, um, uh, subclass your, your actual class and will do all the wiring to, to pass you an instance of the dependency that you're looking for. Uh, and we'll do uh, all of that at the runtime. It will scan your class path at runtime. It will use reflection for some manipulations, like, for example, changing the visibility of private fields and whatnot. Uh, uh, we'll do all of that at runtime. Although it's true that they're moving some part of the workloads to, to do that uh, compile time, but, uh, but mostly everything happens at runtime. Uh, reflection is really slow. And because reflection is slow, uh, there are uh, reflection uh, metadata caches. Uh, but uh, not only for, for example, for Spring, but also Hibernate has its reflection cache. Uh, so memory consumption uh, grows and grows and grows and grows. The approach we took is different. Uh, the approach we took is hook into the compilation phase, right? So we process the source code at compilation phase and generate all the framework infrastructure at compile time. Uh, and we produce bytecode. We produce bytecode which sits along your classes. So uh, at runtime, there's no reflection. There's no proxy generation, there's no dynamic class loading, uh, no class path scanning, nothing. Uh, another difference is that, for example, the stack traces. So, so how big is the stack trace in Spring? It's like a huge, right? Because you've got your classes and then a lot of things like proxy, blah, 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 right? Uh, with macro, that's not the case, right? Because uh, there are two, three classes per bin, more or less, something like that, uh, like a bin definition, a bin implementation, and that's about it. Uh, so it's much easier to debug. Uh, like I said, it's a, general, it's a general purpose framework. You can use it with any built tool language. Well, not any language. It's uh, Java, Groovy, and Kotlin supported. Uh, all major clouds, major uh, technologies, etc. In terms of history, uh, as I said, we started in 2017. Uh, on 2018, we released the first version, and today we are in version 3, 3.9. Uh, we are about to release version 4 um, very soon. A quick overview of the features. Um, dependency injection is the core feature. Um, so you can use uh, JSR 3CO annotations or, or even Spring ones. Uh, regarding the Spring integration is, is actually nice because uh, uh, we have the ability to take a Spring application. Uh, if you take a Spring application, you add a micro dependency, the micro runtime dependency, and the micro annotation processor to Spring application without changing the source code. We are able to run that application as a micro application. And the way that this happens is because we are able to, to map at compile time the Spring annotations into the micro ones for those that are uh, like a um, uh, equivalency. Uh, for example, in Spring, you will see that later, but you can have get mapping with name it get, right? Uh, so that's mostly the same. So there are like 80% uh, of the annotations are the same. Uh, and for those cases, you, can, you could even do that. Um, in terms of configuration, uh, you can use different configuration formats. Uh, you can have type safe configuration classes, uh, validation, built-in validation into the uh, configuration, etc. For validation, um, we have built-in uh, validation module, annotation base as well, 
but it is again our own implementation, reflection free, uh, way faster than a Hibernate validator, but it's not fully compliant with Beam validation API because that API, that specification is, is uh, reflection based for some parts of it. Uh, so if you need the, the full Beam validation spec support, you can just uh, add Beam validation API to your, to your class path. Uh, there is an AOP framework uh, that we use internally, and if you are developing libraries, you could use it as well. But again, the difference with all this is that uh, everything is compile time and reflection free. Uh, this will be Hello World. Uh, so as you can see, the programming model is annotation based, so people coming from Spring will feel at home. Um, Uh, there is also an HTTP client integrated. So, do you know Spring Cloud Open Thing? Yeah, the declarative clients. Yes, correct. Uh, so, this would be similar. Uh, you add an annotation to an interface with uh, micronode uh, annotation mappings like get, post, etc. Uh, and we generate the client at compile time. So, again, Thing or Open Thing will generate the client at runtime. Uh, the Microsoft implementation will generate the client at compile time. Uh, in terms of messaging, we have support for the major uh, systems, for data access as well. Uh, there is a module called Micronaut Data, which uses the repository pattern. So you should be familiar with this if you've used the Spring Data before. Um, but there are differences. Like, for example, again, this is going to be implemented at compile time, right? Uh, there's some uh, nice features, like for example, based on the method name, uh, we, will, we will figure out which is the query that we need to generate, like you have in this uh, find by uh, example, right? Uh, but there's something even better, which is if you make a typo. So imagine we have a, suppose we have a user class, right? User entity class uh, that is supposed to have a name property. If you make a typo on the property, it will not compile, right? As opposed to uh, having a runtime exception with other frameworks, right? The same happens, for example, when you in a controller, when you use a path variable, you know a path variable can you you, know, you need to refer the um, in, in in curly braces, you, you put a path variable, and that, that needs to match the name of the parameter in the method, right? If you were to make a typo there, it will not compile. So we will we will compile time check those things uh, for you. So you know you don't you need to get until runtime to discover your uh, issue. In terms of security. Um, well, I wouldn't uh, enter into much details, but essentially we got you covered, so all the major things uh, are there. Uh, it's, again, annotation-based, but you can use configuration if you, if you will, um, open AV Connect, uh, was to JWT, blah, blah, blah. And there are more things. Distributed tracing, distributed configuration, service discovery, uh, and, you know, GraphQL. Uh, there is a nice integration with test containers. Uh, which not only allows you to use test, con test containers directly, but also we will enable you uh, what is called test resources. And test resources is a way to, um, without any additional configuration, uh, we will uh, determine based on your dependencies and your configuration if we need to, to spin up a test container. For example, if you have, uh, I don't know, the Micronaut Data JDBC and the MariaDB driver on the class path, and you have not provided uh, the, um, the JDBC URL for, for that particular environment, uh, we will spin up a test container automatically for you, and we will wire up those configuration properties into the application. And you can, uh, you can use that for development, so running the application, you run the application. Before running the application, we will start the test container. We can leave it running on the background if you will, so you can stop and start the server uh, um, no matter how many times you want. Um, and the same happens for tests. So you can write a test, and we will 
Uh, you can run your test many times, but we will keep the container running all the time if you want. So the integration with test containers is, is really nice. Um, how you get started? So there is a website called Micronaut Launch, uh, launch.micronaut.io. Uh, this is uh, similar to Spring, uh, start Spring.io. Uh, you select like the features, uh, Java version, um, et cetera, and we will generate a skeleton application for you. Uh, this is CLI, if you're more like a terminal person, uh, an IntelliJ IDEA Ultimate Wizard, or a Visual Studio Code extension. Uh, some comments on uh, what's coming in Micronaut 4. Uh, we're ramping the, the minimum, the baseline, uh, the Java baseline to Java 17. So Micron 3 supports from Java 8 uh, onwards. Uh, Micron 4 will only support Java 17. Uh, so upgrade uh, if you haven't done so yet. Uh, this will uh, allow us not only to use the, you know, the modern features of the language ourselves in the internal code base, uh, but also will have benefits uh, for the end user. Uh, like, for, some, for example, you could use uh, a build thread uh, if you want. Uh, there is a new uh, lighter weight client implementation based on the new uh, JDK HTTP client. Um, and if you need to use any other version, you can use Micro 3 that will be supported for, for several years. Uh, the new version of Micro Data 4 will support Hibernate 6 and Hibernate Reactive. Um, the runtime is, the micro runtime is becoming uh, smaller and lighter. So, a hello world in Micron 3 uh, normally takes in a modern hardware like 300 milliseconds ish, more or less, to start. Uh, with Micron 4, we're in the range of 200 milliseconds. That is close to raw netty. Uh, this is uh, an amazing. Uh, achievement because uh, you can't imagine how much time we spend on shaving every millisecond we can from the startup time, right? Uh, actually, one of the magnet committers uh, is a netty committer. Um, so you can imagine the net integration we have is really, um, really tight. Um, and there are other features uh, that you should be able to check once we do the release. Uh, there will be like a new uh, compile time expression language, similar to Spring Spell, but again, compile time checked, so no typos. And uh, something called control panel, micro control panel, that is going to be a development UI where you can check uh, what's going on in your application. Uh, you can check. Uh, all the configuration properties, uh, sorry, the property sources that have been loaded into your application, where are they coming from, what they have inside, where are their priorities. Uh, you can check uh, all the, the bins that have been loaded in, uh, for a particular package and their dependencies. Uh, you can interact with the login system uh, and live disable or enable login for particular packages. Uh, so that's about it. Uh, now let's talk something about GraalVM. So how many of you have used GraalVM? OK, very few. Uh, let me tell you what it is. So uh, GraalVM is an open JDK distribution. You can use it for your local development. Uh, it's the, the JDK that I have on my machine, right? It's GraalVM. You, instead of Eclipse to Marine, you can use uh, GraalVM, and it's going to be the same because this is an official open JDK distribution. Uh, and on top of the regular Java JDK uh, tools like Java, Java C, etc., there is a new component uh, called native image. Uh, so with GraalVM, you have two options, two choices, two uh, different paths you can follow. One is like the regular one. So you compile your application and you run it with the just-in-time compiler. Okay? The other option is 
use AOT compiler, an AOT compiler to produce a native executable for your machine. Uh, the difference is that this native executable will start in a fraction of the time than the regular JVM. You will see that later. So the goals are to start fast. Uh, it consumes much less memory. Uh, uh, minimize vulnerability because uh, the native image, this executable I'm telling you, is a closed uh, world version of your application. So the IoT compiler will traverse through your code and will drop from the image uh, code that is uh, not reachable, right? Uh, so it will optimize, uh, essentially reducing the surface attack of your application. Uh, and we'll give you a single binary that you can distribute for that particular architecture. That means that, for example, if I produce a native image on Mac, it can only be run on Mac. Uh, in this case, um, ARM, or if it's an Intel, then on Intel, or whatever. Uh, the combination of Micronaut and GraalVM is special, uh, because GraalVM is supported by the three or four major Java frameworks, so Spring, uh, Quarkus, Helidon, uh, they all support Micronet as well. Uh, sorry, GraalVM. Uh, the integration from Micronet is special. Uh, I'll tell you why, but you can get as low as six milliseconds to start of time. So remember, 300 versus six for a hello world. Uh, you can see like a non-trivial application, how, how much it, it, it takes. Uh, memory consumption is, again, a fraction like 10% of uh, a regular Java application. So regular Java Micronet application, Hello World, could be uh, around, I don't know, 100 megabytes of heap. Uh, with GraalVM is like, I don't know, 15, 12, 20, something like that. And the throughput, on some cases, is even better because uh, GraalVM has its, its own uh, compiler uh, that performs uh, some optimizations on your code. Uh, and this combination of Micronaut and GraalVM is unique because they are both developed at Oracle Labs, so the teams are next to each other. Um, also because Micronaut has been ready for GraalVM uh, native image since day one, right? Uh, it took others uh, several years to get uh, uh, this support for, for GraalVM because uh, essentially for GraalVM, Whenever you use reflection, or when you generate uh, dynamic proxies on the fly, or for example, when you uh, load a class dynamically, right? If you load a class dynamically, uh, GraalVM needs to know because it needs to put that class into the image uh, at image building time, right? You cannot at runtime on um, GraalVM load any random class if it's not in the image, right? Uh, same happens with reflection, right? Reflection needs to be uh, properly configured. So, uh, it's true that GraalVM has become better at detecting automatically uh, reflection usages or, 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 for example, proxy generation. Uh, because, uh, uh, for example, uh, generating a proxy, you could generate a proxy uh, for an interface that is not on the class path, and that class will have to be put on the image as well. So it is a complex situation, but GraalVM more or less will detect all those cases. But essentially, uh, since we don't do any of that, it's been simpler for us to have support for GraalVM. And finally, the extension pack for Visual Studio Code uh, is, is maintained by Oracle as well. Um, and that gives you support for both Micronet and GraalVM in Visual Studio Code. There is a, one use case that I want to tell you about, and it's Disney+. Plus. Disney Plus is using Micronaut and GraalVM for, uh, for the Lambda deployments. So um, uh, if you think about the startup time, it's not only the development experience that you will see that later, but also in a serverless or in a cloud in general, uh, the less time you're actually running things on the cloud, the cheaper it is, right? So less time is less money, literally. And Disney Plus is saving a bunch of money uh, just by using uh, Micronaut and GraalVM for their functions. Uh, this is a comparison of the cold startup, right? The cold startup is the time that it takes 
for a function that is that has not been called before or in a period of time uh, to become ready. Uh, now it's true that the bigger the lambda is, so the more resources it has, uh, the less time it takes to uh, to make it ready, right? So that's that's why you see on the right, you know, the right, like for example, a lambda with three gigabytes of memory will start faster than uh, a lambda with uh, half a, a gigabyte. Uh, but still, you can see the numbers, so it's not even comparable, right? And you're built by the time your lambda executes, right? So that's money. Um, so let's do some coding. We'll have some time for questions uh, after this, so save them for later. Can you see this reasonably well? Yeah. Bigger. Um, good question. Let me try because I think. Um, there is a setting here that should help. So what I have here is an empty Micronaut application generated for Micronaut launch. Uh, the only things that I have added, because they are not relevant for, for the coding session, is a couple of uh, flyway migrations, just to create uh, one table and to insert a couple of rows into the database. That, that's all. But other than that, is an empty main class and uh, application YAML. Uh, this is all generated from Macino Launch, so I didn't change anything. Uh, there's nothing else inside. So let's create some things. So the first thing I'm going to be creating is um, like a team entity. This is going to be a record. And uh, we're going to put here at ID, at generated value. I'm using uh, Jakarta Persistence API uh, annotations, but uh, I'm not using JPA, just the annotations, right? So this is using Micronaut Data JDBC. But uh, you, can, you can see that at the source level, you can use the annotations of uh, JPA, but we are not using Hibernate whatsoever. That's why I had to create the migrations and everything. Uh, Micronaut Data JDBC is the lightweight version, and then you have Micronaut Data JPA, which uses uh, Hibernate under the covers. Long ID, string name, and uh, the stadium. And uh, this is going to be uh, at entity. And that's about it. Now, the next thing I'm going to create is uh, an API contract. And you will understand that later. I'm going to call this team API. Uh, this is an interface. Um, and uh, I'm going to be declaring like a constant path, which is equal to slash teams. And then a um, couple of uh, endpoints. One is um, one is uh, iterable of team list. And the other one is HTTP response of team uh, get, and we receive the ID. And this is a get again, uh, and um, this is the ID, OK? Uh, so in a, in a REST controller, uh, the, you know, depending on the return time, Micronaut will figure out how to render the response to the client. Uh, so in this case, it's, it's a, like a regular list or something that looks like a collection. Uh, so we will you know, serialize that into JSON, 
Uh, by the way, there is another uh, substitution for, for serialization called micron serialization, uh, which is a replacement for Jackson. Jackson is, is great, but it's heavily based on reflection. It will add, uh, um, I don't know, 100 milliseconds of overhead to the, your startup. Uh, so by default, we ship with micron uh, serialization. But again, you can use Jackson annotations, and we will figure out how to read that and, and make this realization uh, ready. But by default, like for example, I have a record, I don't have to specify any annotation, right? Defaults will just work. Uh, now let's implement first the controller. So this is going to be class team controller. which implements team API. So let's implement the methods. Uh, I'm going to be declaring a constructor dependency. So this is a private final. Um, oh, before that, let's create the repository. Team repository, repository interface, uh, which is a um, this is a JDBC repository because I'm using uh, Micro Data JDBC. I need to specify the, dia the dialect uh, because uh, Micro Data needs to know, you know, for which uh, database it needs to generate the queries uh, at compile time. And this extends from CRUD repository and the entity. It's going to be team, uh, and the primary key is long. And uh, that's it, because uh, with, with the default queries, I'm all set. I don't need anything else. So then in my controller, I will add this constructor dependency, so private final team repository, and then constructor. So the constructor based injection, no need for at inject annotation. Uh, this is implicit. Micro will figure out since there is no default constructor. This is the only way to create an instance of your controller, and it will give you an instance of the repository for you. Uh, the least operation is simply repository final. Uh, like I said, if you return a collection or a pojo or something simple, uh, Micro will render that as JSON, uh, but you can wrap that content, that body, into an HTTP response in case you want to tweak, I don't know, something about the HTTP response, like uh, status code or headers or whatever, right? So in this case, what I'm doing is repository, find my ID, and then uh, we're going to convert this into HTTP response OK, with the body enclosed. Uh, or else, or else what? Uh, not found. Which is this? Um, I think I'm done. So let's run this. Uh, still 50 minutes. So let's run this and see how it looks like. There's, there's different ways to run a uh, micro application. Uh, most simple one is just go to the you know to the main class and run it from the from your ID that will just work if the demo gods are, are with me. I think they are. So um, yeah, that took a long. Yeah, don't laugh. That's unfair. It's probably something related to the network. OK, 672 milliseconds. OK, that's probably OK. Uh, and then I have, um, what do I have? Some requests. So we can request this last team, team's endpoint. Demo gods. Oh, yes. Good spot. Yeah. Very nice. Um, bonus point for you. So this is a controller, obviously. And we need to specify the path. 
And that's why I have the constant for. So let's run this again. Uh, and then if we go over here, why? Empty platform server. Let me disconnect the Wi Fi. You never know. OK, let's do something else. Let's do something else, because uh, in case this could happen, I got a solution project. So don't worry. This time, I'm going to be using a different way to run the application. So there is, um, there is a Maven plugin or a Gradle plugin that you can use. And in this case, if you use mnrun, it will run the application in development mode. Running the application in development mode means that we will um, we will we will scan for changes in your source code, and whenever is a source code change on the application, we will restart the server, not hot reload, but restart. Uh, the reason why we did this is because hot reloading an application is uh, essentially a kind of worms. So um, it's uh, really difficult uh, to get it working correctly for all these situations because you have frameworks that uh, do nasty things with class loaders and stuff like that. So we didn't, we didn't want to mess with that. And since uh, startup time is uh, so fast, we thought it was uh, you know, enough to just restart the application. Uh, OK, so now if we go to, if we go where? If we go here, oh, come on. It's failing. I don't know why. OK, trust me, I've done this uh, several times. It should work. Uh, but for some reason, it's not. Uh, let me check real quick. So 8080, everything was correct. Yes, migrations uh, have been uh, created. And it says it's listening. So. OK, this makes sense because this is just Teams. Oh, we have it. So Intel was fooling me. Yeah. OK, so we have this, and then we can get a team by ID. And if we get, I'll do that here. So if we curl a team uh, minus I0, like, for example, an ID that doesn't exist, uh, we get. Um, Maybe it's localhost the problem. Whatever. So it's not found, right? Not found. OK. Um, the, the final thing that I want to show you, I have still some time to do that, is uh, the GraalBeam integration, right? Oh, before that, uh, let's write a test. So sh should I write a test for it? Yeah? OK, let's do that. Uh, let me make sure that uh, we don't have. Actually, I will use the solution project. I will use the solution project. OK, this is how a test looks like. Uh, it, this is a JUnit 5 test. Uh, you can use JUnit 5, Spock, or, or Code Test if you're using Kotlin. 
Uh, the idea is that you annotate a class with, um, with microtest. This will spin up a, um, an instance of your application on a random port and will, will allow you to do dependency injection on your test. Um, so you can, for example, grab a bin, uh, invocate a method on a bin, and then make an assertion over the response, right? So, so now, um, how many of you use uh, Mojito in your test? Like a lot of you, right? So uh, one of the reasons why unit testing in general and the, the, the testing pyramid is like a lot of unit tests and then less integration tests and then very few functional tests is because uh, normally uh, functional testing is expensive, takes a lot of time. Uh, consumes, um, well, memory is irrelevant, but it's mostly about uh, the time that it takes, right? So it's not feasible to wait, I don't know, 10 seconds for a single test to run, right? So then you write a unit test and then you start, you need to mock things out, et cetera, right? Uh, with a framework with the start time, like the one from Micronaut, you will reconsider this uh, testing pyramid. Uh, because, uh, for example, I can run a single test, and again, if the demo gods are with me, it should pass. It took 400 milliseconds. This is including, um, obviously, speeding up the server, running the flyway migrations, because it's the whole application, right? Is everything running? There's no mocking, there's no uh, is like the real application uh, running on your test, and it took 400 milliseconds. So the feedback cycle is amazing, as you can see, right? And now you would say, uh, I don't believe you, because uh, this is impossible that we're running uh, like the server and having a client. Um, there is uh, another thing that I didn't show you that I will show you right now. You remember this team API uh, interface that I created? There's two, uh, two children. One is the server, and in another one is the client. So this is a nice thing to create a testing client for your application with a single contract. This is amazing, isn't it? Right? So you have an interface with all your server uh, endpoints, and then you implement the same way on the controller and the client. Right? took me no code to implement it, as you can see, it's an interface, right? And I'm grabbing this client to make requests, right? I don't have to deal with the low-level HTTP client. There is one if you want to use it, but I don't have to deal with that. Um, so, uh, and you have full access to, like, to whatever the interface is returning. So, for example, this is returning a team, so I have you know, the response already serialized into an entity. Or in this uh, get example, uh, we have the, um, the response wrapper, so we can check the status code uh, or make an insertion on the body, right? So let's run this one. This one was a bit faster, 367 uh, milliseconds. Uh, this is uh, absolutely amazing. Um, and uh, another thing I want to show you is, uh, because I, I knew you would be uh, suspicious and, and say, OK, this is going to be fake. This can be real. Uh, so let me show you, for example, the, um, uh, the logback configuration file. So I've included trace level for, for the HTTP client. Demonstrate to demonstrate you that we are running the application on a random port. We're making a request to the endpoint, and we're having a response. We're serializing that, and we're running everything in less than 400 milliseconds. How do you like this? Do you like this? Yeah. Final thing. Native image. So let's do that. Um, 
there's a, um, so you know, Maven package will, generally speaking, package your application by default. Maven package will give you jar file. Uh, we have custom packaging types um, via the Magnet Maven plugin. Uh, so, for example, if you specify that, w that your packaging type is a native image, you will get the native image binary of your application. Uh, nothing else is required. Um, I have been doing this uh, demo for, for quite a few years. Um, like three years ago, uh, I couldn't uh, generate the native image uh, live on stage because it wouldn't finish and it would blow up my, my laptop. Uh, but now it's, you know, modern hardware um, and newer versions of GraalVM uh, will do this in less than a minute. Uh, there's other packaging types, like for example, you can specify a Docker packaging and then we will give you Docker image. We can push it to a registry if you will. Uh, or you can specify Docker native, and what we will do is we will build the native image inside the Docker container and um, give you that Docker image, or push it if you will, right? Uh, and everything is done under the Maven package um, lifecycle phase. So this is about to finish. One minute including Maven um, overhead. So this is target uh, team solution. Be ready to, to, to watch it, because uh, if you blink it, you miss it. OK, this was unfair. Let me do it again. 37 milliseconds. And this is including flyaway and blah, 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 migrations and everything. So this is absolutely amazing. Um, so let's wrap this up. Uh, as you can see, um, so th uh, this is a general purpose framework. You don't have to change your current framework uh, if you don't have to. But I want you to think about uh, things you saw here that would maybe reconsider if you think that this is a better developer experience. I personally think it is. So uh, you get faster feedback while developing, because everything runs faster, feels uh, like, like a smaller. And you could argue, OK, this is a hello world, and uh, um, you know, whenever you are working on a real application, this will get much worse. Now, the, different, the, the reality about that is, uh, is not entirely true. Um, in Spring or Jakarta EE, uh, the number of beans in your application have an impact um, proportionally to the startup time. It's, it's proportional. The more beans you have, the slower your application is. But with Magnet, it's not the case, right? Uh, it, it's, it's obviously going to consume a bit more, but it's not going to be linear proportion, right? Uh, so in a real application, uh, obviously, we wouldn't be talking about uh, 37 milliseconds, but who cares if it's 100, right? So it, it's really fast. So now imagine the places where you can introduce uh, Java or, uh, or your application, like, for example, serverless functions that start uh, really fast. Or, for example, if you're deploying into Kubernetes, you can have um, like a rolling deployment that can uh, grow and, and shrink your application really quickly. Uh, so I want you to think about all those things and then potentially consider if you want to change um, to Micronaut. Um, so we have some time for questions. Uh, meanwhile, I have a small survey for you. It's a single question with a 1 to 5 rating. So I really appreciate if you can uh, like give me feedback about this uh, presentation. Um, I understand the demo gods were not with me today, or partially. Uh, the test passed. Uh, so at least the test passed. So I'm happy with that. Uh, but please, if you have time, uh, I will appreciate your, your feedback about that. And um, at the same time, can someone make a question for me that I'm really happy to answer? There is one over there. I think you need a mic. 
Okay. No, you can you can use reflection. Uh, uh, what I said is that uh, we don't use reflection internally in the framework, but you can use reflection, right? Uh, there's um, I think there's always um, different ways. So you can you can still use uh, Mockito in your test. There's nothing preventing you from, from doing that. Do you have any other question? One over there. Well, I can come closer to you and uh, <laughs> hear you. Yes. So, two questions. The first one is about hypernet validator. You say that Micronaut actually supports it. Yes. I understand how Micronaut can scan the source code and build those proxies during the compile cycle. Yes. Okay. But hypernet validator is already a compiled library that has a lot of reflections in it. Yes. So, how do you, um, how do you work with those? So, Right, so the, the question is uh, how uh, Hypernet validator works in a Micronet application. Uh, the answer is similar to the previous one. So uh, it's not the case that you can't use reflection in a Micronet application, but obviously if you do, you're, uh, you're adding overhead to your application, right? So, so adding Hypernet validator to your class path will possibly duplicate your startup time and will skyrocket your memory consumption, right? You can still use it. And reflection will work, everything will work. So that's not the question, but... Uh, okay. and the second one is about... Yes. Yes. Java has just a time compiler. Correct. And, and that's why it's uh, so, uh, so performable Correct. on a, on a local yep. basis. But as far as I'm concerned, when you create a native library, so yes. there is no just a time compiler. There's no just a time compiler. So just make a binary and that's it. It's Correct. Correct. But if you are deploy a regular Java application, so it will compile specific Correct. that are uh, for this node. Yes. And if it's, if it's possible that you make uh, a binary that is not uh, suitable for a node you have. Yes. Uh, so the question is uh, how essentially what is the difference between the JIT compiler of the JDK and the GraalVM compiler? So when you run an application, um, like uh, for a long time, right? you have a server running, uh, the JIT compiler will kick in. Will after a few iterations, it will learn, you know, um, how your application is being executed, and it will perform some optimizations over your uh, bytecode. Uh, for example, inlining uh, methods or, or whatever, right? That's, that's true. Uh, now, what happens in GraalVM? So in GraalVM, it's true there's no uh, JIT compiler, but there's a GraalVM compiler which has its own optimizations. It does those optimizations at compile time. And the benchmarks say that uh, they're running benchmarks, for example, for mathematical operations um, and, uh, I don't know, artificial intelligence uh, uh, libraries, things like that. Uh, they get better performance than, uh, than the JIT compiler. So it's absolutely amazing the effort they have done to, to make. They even made a, a Java program doing mathematical operations faster than the C counterpart. It's absolutely amazing. So the throughput is incredible. It's incredible. They obviously you know, depending on your application, this is not uh, like a, a golden rule for all applications. So depending on your use case, it may be that uh, for your use case, uh, you know, the JIT compiler is, is going to be better. But uh, generally speaking, I can say it's really performant. Really, really performant. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Chris, thanks a lot for this talk. And yeah, my pleasure. Yes. What is the performance yes. The question, the question is how difficult it is to migrate from Spring Boot to, to Micronaut? Uh, the answer is uh, this is a political deal. It's not a technical issue. It's a political issue, right? Uh, if you are able to solve your political issue, then uh, technically speaking, what it takes. Uh, there are several approaches you could take. So one is 
One is, for example, uh, potentially use Open Rewrite. We have uh, one of the maintainers here. Uh, open Rewrite to, to write a migration for that. That will be one of the things. But uh, we, we offered you different ways which we think are better. So one is using uh, the Migrant for Spring library. With this library, we can take a Spring application. You can keep the Spring source code, Spring annotations, but add a couple of dependencies, uh, runtime dependency and a notation processor dependency, and we will run that as a Micronaut application, and everything will just work, but we will just not use uh, the Spring application context whatsoever. But we will use, we will have your beans and your controllers and everything. Obviously, this is for the cases. Like we have, for example, most of the Spring MVC, Spring Security. Uh, there are many annotations supported that we map them at compile time. Uh, and uh, with this approach, so, so the first application, the first Spring application in the world that was able to run on GraalVM a few years ago was thanks to Microsoft for Spring. So we have that, uh, that uh, success. Uh, so because they, they, wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't have a Spring native back then. It wouldn't work at all. Uh, but at the Microsoft for Spring, uh, we, would, we were able to actually have a Spring source code compiled into a native image. So that is one thing that will obviously cover like a basic um, application, or not very basic, but uh, depending on your application, on the libraries you use, uh, normally everything else will just work, because if you have Jackson, it will work. If you use Hibernate, it will work. Right? So uh, more or less everything it will work. Uh, for other use cases, uh, the recommended approach would, uh, would be to use uh, Micronaut Spring Starter dependency. Right, but then you will have to, to switch from. Uh, you will have to switch uh, partially from Spring building blocks into Migrant ones. That will require a bit more effort, right? And uh, there's another way. Like for example, you can have uh, um, in Spring application, you can set uh, the Migrant application context to be the parent of the Spring application context. So with this approach, you can mix and match Spring beans and Micronaut beans in the same application. And this works because uh, the Spring application context has a hierarchy. Uh, so essentially, when someone is requesting a bean of a particular type, it will, you know, if the current application context doesn't have it, it will ask to its parent. So with this trick, you're able to mix and match uh, beans uh, from the two frameworks, and you can you know, while the application is still running, you can, uh, you can uh, migrate them step by step. What is the expected performance on that? Uh, I don't know. So, hello world in spring, what it is, two seconds, something like that. So, two seconds versus uh, 300, right? So, it's 10% is, uh, less, not 10%, 90% less, right? So, and uh, like I said, the bigger the application is, uh, so there, there is a linear dependency between the lines of code and the number of bins your application has. Because Spring will actually scan your class path. Your entire class path <laughs> at runtime, it will look for rotations. Um, uh, they are removing some parts of that, with, for example, with this uh, uh, annotation index. Uh, so they're like, um, uh, moving some things to the compile phase, but but it's still uh, it will take a lot, right? So with with the big application, the bigger the, the application is, the more uh, benefit you will you will face. And again, some will argue, okay, but I have my server running all the time in EC2 instance or whatever. So why do I need to start that fast? And the answer is, is because of you, not because of the server. So the server doesn't care, but you do. Right? So you want something that you can play with really quickly, uh, something you, you, that you can dispose and restart and rerun again and run test uh, and feel fast. Right? So I think that's the key. Do you have any other question? Thank you very much. You've been a fantastic audience.